Hello everyone that's just joined, uh, we'll just wait a few minutes to get everyone in, there's a few people still to join in. Um, so yeah, we won't, be, we won't be long, we'll just wait a few moments um, and let everyone join in. Hope everyone's got their stuff okay, hope everyone's doing well, and yeah, we're all ready to go, all ready to set up, it should be exciting, a little tasting. Mm -hmm. Hello everyone just joining, we're just going to wait a few minutes to get everyone, let everyone join in and get set up because um, we've got quite a few people to join in so we'll give it five minutes or so um, and then we can get started with everything. Um, there is a few people outside at the chip shop looking in at the moment, so I do apologise if we get interrupted during the stream. I don't know whether people uh, were still closed at the, the second shop, so uh, which is where I am at the moment. So yeah, I do apologise if we do get interrupted, um, but we hopefully hopefully should be okay. Um, yeah, ready for our second tasting. Mm -hmm. See how many have we got left to join? A fair, fair few left to join yet, so give it a few more minutes. Oops. So, hello everyone that's just joined. We're just waiting for a few extra people to, to get themselves set up. So it'll just be a few moments before we start. Um, but we, yeah, should be a nice tasting today. Um, we decided with this one that we were gonna do something around World Gin Day, which was just Saturday, Saturday just gone, um, and showcase some bits, bits from all over really, because there's some really interesting bits out there. Um, so I'm looking forward to showing you through some bits and we've got a couple of people joining as well which would be really great, um, a couple of different reps and things. So we'll be able to chat through um, from their point of view as well um, and hear about any exciting developments they've got coming up. So should be exciting. Um, I hope everybody's got everything. I believe uh, there was some that only got theirs today quite late on, which we apologise about this. Jeff's car's unfortunately broken. I've stupidly sprained my ankle from wearing chunky trainers. It's completely my own fault. So it's just Barry being the delivery man at the moment. <laughs> so he's been running around a little bit. Um, but yeah, hopefully everyone has got theirs all fine. Um, you may notice with this kit, if anybody that was on the uh, Matmira kit, uh, Matmira tasting or the first gym one, um, they're in completely little unbranded bottles. We have decanted these uh, into these little bottles um, because many of the kind of more global gins don't necessarily do miniatures. So uh, I can quite safely say it took a long time. It took about an hour and a half per gin, <laughs> but it hopefully, hopefully it'll be worth it. So um, I've got some interesting gins as well. It gives us a little bit more scope, um, but it is quite a fiddly process with them, sanitizing them all then decanting them in. Um, but yeah, got there with them all. Uh, we're in the second shop. So we're in uh, 358. We are unfortunately not open here yet. So we do have some exciting news as well. We have now um, opened our, reopened our Sharaville shop. So we can do click and collect. So if you're on the website, uh, we would recommend people uh, browsing the website and click uh, using the option of click and collect, which is really great. But we are now open uh, with sort of obviously um, 
procedures in place. So we've got like a big glass screen at the front and the counter at the front of the shop. Um, but unfortunately, we've not got the second shop up and running just yet. Uh, we're going to kind of get everything up and running at 357, three, 257, sorry. Um, and then we can see how that goes. And then eventually, hopefully sooner rather than later, get 358 open um, and you guys can come and, come and see it. Um, but we've got a lovely rainbow wall of wine uh, behind us. Um, and it, the, we've got a really lovely big table in here. So it's a really nice, um, really lovely setting. It's just really unfortunate that we can't use it for what we wanted, which was tastings. So hopefully in the near future, we'll be able to bring you more tastings again. Um, actual in-person ones as opposed to through a screen. Um, but for the meantime, we'll have to just stick with these. So I think we should, I think we've got, might have a few more people waiting to view, but I might just start. So we've got a bit of an introduction um, and then we'll go into the gin and things as well. So I always like to do a bit of a welcome. Welcome to our tasting um, and, bit, and a little bit about us. Um, I know many of you will probably be familiar with us, um, but it's always nice to just introduce it. You know, we've been going for about seven years. We're a really small team of four people. Uh, it's Barry and Jeff that own it, uh, myself and Sarah. Um, we're happy to offer any advice on the vast world of booze because it is, in all honesty, quite a confusing, uh, quite a confusing realm. Quite, quite a lot of stuff in there. So we're always happy to help. Um, and sometimes there'll be things that people ask us and we have no idea, but we will always happily do a bit of research into it and find out for you. Um, so, as I mentioned, we've got two stores, obviously our one on Sharavale Road, which we've now got open, which is great. Looking forward to seeing some uh, familiar faces again. Um, and then we have our second one here in forward. And this picture on the screen gives you an idea of what it looks like when it's lovely and tidy um, and the rainbow wall of wine. Unfortunately, there's a, quite a few boxes in here at the moment, so it doesn't look as pristine as that. Um, but yeah, it's a really lovely, lovely space. So with gin uh, being incredibly popular, with the last tasting we did with our first virtual gin, chase, gin tasting, we kind of covered more um, about the history of gin, the popularity of it, some of the stats, things in the industry, um, and did uh, UK gins. So we looked at some Yorkshire-based ones, from some from like the coast down in Cornwall, etc. Um, some of our kind of favourite bits that we really love. Um, but for this one, we've decided to go for a different different tangent and go for World Gym. Um, we have about 120 in store. We can get hold of all sorts though. Um, and there is, you know, it's a very big industry. Um, but as I say, it's a big industry, the drinks industry in general. But we can always try and look for things as well if you're after things. Um, and I've realised I don't think I've ever done a little bit about me. So me personally, I've been working in the the industry for coming up to five years now. I kind of fell into it accidentally uh, after I finished uni. Started working in like a hybrid uh, wine bar and shop in Warrington, where I'm from originally. And then come over to Sheffield and I've uh, been with Jeff Barry for maybe two years in December. So a year and a half now. So, yeah. And um, I'm a big, big fan of gin. I've always enjoyed gin, but I do enjoy all the bits and pieces as well. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit, a little bit of background on me. Not that anyone needs to know that, but hey. so things you'll need for the tasting. Uh, we've got some lemon peel, lemon peel, some lime wedges, uh, grapefruit peel, and an orange wedge. Now the reason we say about lemon and grapefruit peel is because sometimes with some of the gins. You just need a little bit in there and sometimes a whole wedge, especially the grapefruit can be quite overpowering and then it, you kind of lose some of the flavors of the other gins. So I've got all my botanicals here in these little dishes. And also, if you have it, some berries or mango, frozen berries or mango are great, some pink peppercorns if you have it, but I couldn't find any and I have got some berry and mango. Um, but we like to keep it quite simple. Obviously it's not ideal having to go out to find pink peppercorns at the moment. So we generally like to keep things uh, keep things simple and just ready to hand. Also recommend having a couple of different glasses. So having uh, one for each and one for mixing as well and a separate glass if you want to taste the tonic separately. There's a way that we'll go through this is that we'll, we'll, we ask you to taste the gins neat because you often get different sort of flavour profiles, different kind of uh, botanicals coming through neat. 
And then when you add the tonic and you add that extra dimension in there, it cha- can often change and you've got different flavors coming through. Um, if you're not a fan of drinking neat spirits, just add a little tiny splash of tonic in it. Um, if you can, uh, if you can, but I would really recommend trying it neat first and then with the tonic, um, cause it, it does make quite a difference to the gins. Um, and yeah, it's something that, something that we do quite a bit of when we're tasting, we always try and taste it neat, um, neat first and then, then add tonic and things like that. So now before we get on to a bit of the introduction bit, the first one that we're going to do is death's door. So this is what the bottle looks like. Um, so if you want to do a little gin and tonic with that one, um, or do a little bit neat, and then the tonic we're using for it is the Fentiman's um, naturally light tonic water, which would be really good. And I'll come to that in a uh, in a moment. A bit about Death Store. We can go through uh, their their process and things like that. But that's the first one. So if you want to get those open ready uh, and start having a little drink, you're more than welcome to. So. World Gin Day. World Gin Day is a thing, and we decided for this tasting we were going to do it around World Gin Day. It would be really easy to just go and pick more gins from the UK, and you know that's great. But with it being World Gin Day, just got um, this Saturday just gone on the thirteenth. We thought you know perfect time to showcase some World Gins, um, and it is an actual thing. Um, I know there's a lot of random and weird days that out there. That's you know like a I think I saw. I've seen some really odd ones, can't think of any off the top of my head, but just really peculiar things like National Pizza Day is a thing, apparently. Um, but yeah, World Gin Day is a thing, and it's quite a legitimate thing as well. So it started back in about 2009. Uh, there was a guy who wanted to basically just bring his friends together. He, I think he was in Birmingham, and he just wanted to bring his friends together to drink gin. So they'd meet up on the second Saturday of every June, go together, drink some gin. And it was a great, great kind of like uh, social a social event great way of like getting together and just enjoying something that they all really enjoyed um one of his close friends that was part of the group that joined in emma stokes she suggested maybe doing it in london the year later so since 2010 they uh, used to meet up in london they used to um used to just go go down go to a couple of different small bars that serve gins and they would you know drink their way around london have a great time um but since then, so it sort of started to gain in popularity. Um, and they started to, you know, put pull more out about it and say, look, we're gonna we're gonna do this on this day. We're gonna go out and we're gonna enjoy gin together. And it slowly but surely uh, gathered more um, more speed and became a bigger event. So Emma took over in 2013, uh, like formally took over. And by that point, they'd grown to you know a substantial event and. From then, they've grown to a global event. So you can see other stats on the screen. It's reached over 200 million people via social media channels in about 30 different countries. Um, the principles of it still remains the same. You know, get together, drink some gin, enjoy some gin with friends if you can. Um, and obviously, the events. There's lots of events that go on. There's things like different gin festivals which you can go to and things like that. Obviously, this year not so much. Um, everything was done virtually. Um, but there's some really fantastic events that go on and some really great information that goes out around around that day. So if you're ever uh, curious, it's always worth um, looking at your favourite uh, distillers or gin makers, see what they're up to around that time, because they will often be doing stuff. Um, and Emma Stokes, she actually runs a blog, blog called uh, Gin Monkey, a really popular uh, Instagram and blog page. She started it not actually meaning to be about gin but eventually you know kind of developed it into being gin um and she's some really interesting bits and pieces on there as well um so yeah it's a it's a really popular day it's so cel- as i said celebrated all over the world there's a, another popular gin blogger in australia i think she's called the gin queen um and again she hosts things over that side of the world distilleries get involved all over um and yeah it's great great way of kind of finding new different bits and learning a little bit about your kind of favorite favorite distilleries. There is also a World Gin Day uh, gin, which you can see on the screen, which is from Boutique Gin Company. And they source about seven different botanicals from each of the different continents, um, which is something that we'll kind of touch upon today with the with the gins that we're going to go through. Um, and gin is, is a completely global industry. So it's really popular in the UK. Uh, in our last tasting, we looked at 
you know, step the stats in the UK, it's gone over, it, I think it's now a three billion pound market in the UK. Um, but it's a, also a global global industry now. Um, and rightly so as well, there's a lot of botanicals that go into gin um, that come from all over the globe. It's not necessarily easy in the UK to grow some of the botanicals and you, that you would necessarily need. Um, you know, things like coriander seed is often used in gin um, and that doesn't necessarily grow particularly well here. Um, I think it's native to sort of South America. No, sorry, North Africa, <laughs> South, Southern Europe, North Africa and Southwest Asia as well. But things like that, and there's certain um, certain roots and things that there's certain gin botanicals that you will use to in your gin, which kind of give you certain flavors and will bind the liquid to the actual uh, gin itself. And they're not always readily available in the UK. Um, so, you know, things like certain citruses, you often you find citrus in gins, they'll often, often be brought in from other countries. So the market is there for a world, you know, for world gin is a global thing. Um, and in the UK, we export about 46% of, of our gin um, outside of the UK that goes to the EU. Um, we have about seven, over 700 million pounds worth of gin that goes outside of the UK. Um, and some of the biggest markets are places like the US, Spain, and the Philippines, surprisingly. So they have really big uh, markets and a lot of need and want for gin. So although us Brits love the gin, love our gin, and we make a lot of it here, I think we're, I think we're one of the, I think as a country we make probably the most. I'm not too sure on that start though, but I think we do. Um, but it is, you know, it's a big thing and when you kind of look at gin globally you look at other people making gins in different areas you get some really interesting bits and pieces that you wouldn't necessarily get in the uk um just the same as in those places the gins here are quite interesting because of the botanicals and things that might have been sourced locally so it you know there's a lot of scope for experimentation um which is why which is why gin's great isn't it? there's there's a lot lot of different options with it so yeah we really like that it's estimated there are about 6,000 gins globally, about that. So that's, you know, that gives you an idea of how many different recipes there are. And they're all all different, unique recipes. So <laughs> that's an awful lot of gin. But yeah. So I wanted to, on this tasting as well, touch on the tonics. We didn't really speak much about the tonics in the last tasting. We spoke a little bit about the industry itself and how it's a big industry, but the tonics for this one. We've got our four tonics here. We've got the Fentiman's Naturally Light, London Essence, the Double Dutch, and the Fever Tree. Now we did use the Double Dutch and the Fever Tree in the last tasting, so apologies if you were in the last tasting and you would think, oh, they, they weren't my favourite. But we have chosen them for a reason, because some of them pair really well with the gins. Um, and with some of these gins, they're quite complex. They've got quite a lot of uh, like floral botanicals in there and things like that. So it needs to make sure, we just wanted to make sure they're complemented. Well, a little bit about each of these tonics. Um, this Fentiman's one is a British tonic made in Yorkshire, not far from Bradford. Uh, this was made, they started back in 1905. Tonic is as much of a historical industry as gin is as well. Um, but this this brand Fentiman started from um, a ginger beer recipe. It was used as part of a loan. It was used as a down payment for this loan. Um, and Thomas Fentiman never got paid back for the loan, so became the legal owner of the, the ginger beer recipe. Um, so he started experimenting. He used to go and deliver it in these little uh, these little jars, go door to door um, with these with this ginger beer. Um, and the dog on it here as well. Uh, you can probably see that there, the little dog. That was his dog that had won in Crufts. And they were really proud of it. So proud. Uh, that they decided to put it, put it on every single bottle. Um, the thing that's a little bit different about this is they do what's called botanical botanical brewing with it. So they essentially they brew the botanicals. They actually let them ferment slightly, um, which gives them a richer sort of flavour before they uh, carbonate it or anything like that before they blend it. So this one in particular has kaffir lime, lemongrass, and juniper in it. 
so you know made made to go with like more oriental sort of style gins I suppose um those kind of fragrant ones but yeah the some of the tonics the idea is to um is to sort of bring in uh more flavors to the gins and it's to also as well make a, a more grown up drink so you, you can drink these without without um, um alcohol um and we'll you know we'll get to what fever, uh, fever tree in a minute but they rightly say that if your gin's going to be you know your drink's going to be what three quarters or so of a mixer you want it to be something decent you don't want it to be rubbish there's no point no point drinking it the second one we've got is London Essence, um, and these again, another historical company. So they started in 19, 1896, um, and they used traditional distilling techniques. They actually started as um, a company that used to make essences for perfumes. Um, they had lots of different botanicals. They'd like look at making different fragrances and things like that, and then they've developed it into drinks. Um, and in this one in particular, they use quite a bit of citrus in it, which will go really well with one of our one of gins we're going to use. Um, and one of the citruses they use give a really kind of tropical edge to it. So that's why, why I've chosen that one. Our next one is the Fever Tree. Now, I know everyone's probably looking, no, no, I know a lot about Fever Tree, or we drink that all the time. Um, but in terms of premium tonic, they are kind of leaders, leaders in the market. Um, and they've, you know, they've really made a name for themselves and they've really worked to change the market of um, mixers, which is, you know, really great to see. Um, and Fever Tree sort of started back in 2003. There was uh, two people. There was Tim and Charles, and they both worked in the drinks industry. Um, really, you know, excited about new spirits coming out, but noticed there was a lack of uh, premium mixers. So they started experimenting. They started doing research. Um, they found um, quinine from the Dem Democratic Republic of, Co of Congo. Uh, and which is obviously the fever, which comes from the chin, chinchoa tree, uh, also nicknamed the fever tree, which is what we kind of covered in our last tasting. Um, if you do want to have a look at the last tasting, by the way, there'll be a link uh, in the video description to the uh, write-up I did of it. It's quite lengthy, just giving you a heads up, there's lots of information in it, but it goes through kind of like the history if you're interested in any of that as well. Um, and there's some, yeah, interesting random facts in there as well. <laughs> um, and then they also use fruits and herbs from uh, the Mediterranean and uh, oils in that. So that's why it has that really lovely, like floral, um, like slightly herby um, taste, which is why we've paired it with one, a couple of a couple of the gins this evening. And then the final one, so then we can get onto the gin, is the double dutch. So double dutch is um, made by two twins, surprisingly, uh, who are both Dutch, <laughs> and they. Again, similar to the Fever Tree, wanted to exper uh, wanted to experiment and expand the the mixer market, um, and they you know they're really focused on sustainability. Um, but they also wanted to make a drinks that you could have on their own, um, and they do a range of sort of different tonics and sodas and things. And some of them are absolutely fantastic. Um, but this one is, a, I think, a little bit softer. I know last time this was one of the favourite tonics. Um, they use grapefruit in this and juniper berry, but the the bitterness isn't quite as strong in this one. So it just softens it a little, little bit, which I sometimes I think I like a lot. But anyway, so that are the tonics that we're going to be using. And we've kind of chosen them for specific reasons. But now we're going to get to the important bit, the bit that we all want, which is the gin. So as I mentioned, first gin is Death Store, which is from the USA. So we're going over to Wisconsin. Um, and this one's really interesting because they only actually use three botanicals. Now it's a strong gin, it's 47%, so it's punchy, which is why it's so flavorful. Having a higher alcohol content, sometimes when you look at it, having a higher alcohol content, you think, oh God, that's really strong. But what it does sometimes, what alcohol does is it carries flavor. So it gives it, you know, um, more simple spirits to scope to get through bolder, uh, bolder flavors. Um, so if you're tasting neat as well, if you've not really tasted much neat before, um, if you want to smell it, but all you can smell is alcohol when you first smell it, start off with the glass lower and then bring it up to your nose and it should hopefully burn off some of the alcohol on there. Now the three botanicals that they use in this is uh, juniper, obviously. They use coriander seed and fennel. Um, and coriander seed is a really important botanical 
that a lot of gins use because it adds this sort of citrusy uh, spice element to it. Um, and this gin, the beauty with this gin is when you taste it, you taste all three. Uh, so you get the, you know, the, the big bold juniper up front, then you get the softer, um, sort of, sorry, the citrusy, more spicy coriander, and then a really like, soft, quite mentally finish from the fennel. Um, so considering it's only three botanicals, it's surprisingly complex. And incredibly smooth as well. Considering I've not chilled that, it's really smooth, just drinking meat. So it works really well in a range of different cocktails. It's got enough to stand up to, you know, those bold cocktails and bold flavours, but it's also soft enough to drink over ice on the rocks or in a martini or something. And that would be really nice in that because it's so simple, there's nothing to overcomplicate it. So yeah, it's a, an interesting one. Now, the name Death's Door comes from um, the area where they make it. So there's a, a, I think a lake going into Wisconsin, it's called Death's Door, um, and that's where they got that from. And the sort of story behind it is that they used to be known for potatoes, really well known for potatoes. Um, and then I think it was about the 70s, um, it suddenly completely dry, died off. So in 2005, there was a group of people that wanted to stop, bring back, um, sorry, uh, bring back farming in that area, bring back the industry to that area. So they started looking at um, how they could do that. Um, and they started planting wheat. And the original idea was that they plant wheat and it would be used for flour and bread making. Um, however, as they kind of went on with it, they realized there was probably more scope for it if they could do something else with it because there was only so much bread and flour they could, uh, could make. Um, and there was a lot of potential with it as well. So they began to make use the wheat as a base for spirits. So they use it for two, they use it for death door spirits, which uh, they do a couple of different things. They do a gin, a vodka, I think they do like a, a white whiskey as well. And then they also do another like slightly sweeter one. Um, but they also use it uh, for brewing as well for Capital Brewery. Um, so they use the wheat for that. And they've been really sort of keen on supporting the farmers. So originally they planted five acres worth of wheat and they're now up to about 1,200 acres worth of wheat. So the idea is to really support the farmers there to make sure that, that there's the industry there um, and that they can keep that area going. So that was that was their main kind of reason for it. So yeah, it's a really, it's an interesting gin, Death Door. It's actually very simple. It's, it's a local gin to that area and they really you know focus on local. It's a very simple gin, but also quite bold and complex as well which makes it a great gin and tonic gin. I think it's one of those gins that if you, some people like things that are a little bit more simple or they like it, you know, a gin to taste like a gin. Um, there's a lot of people now that kind of say, I'm not into it tasting like X, Y, and Z. I just want my gin to taste like a gin. This would be a perfect kind of thing. There's nothing too over the top with there. And uh, yeah, we really, really like Death Store. Some really good, good gin in there. So what did it, if, um, if you guys have got it set up, if you want to put any comments on, please do. Um, I've got my phone with me, so if you want to get in touch through Facebook as well, you can do as well. Um, and yeah, just let me know which gins, which gins you enjoy and which gins you're perhaps not enjoying so much um, and what, yeah, what your opinions are. But yeah, we're going to move on to the next one now. And I'm going to add in, we've got somebody joining us. So the next gin we've got, is Mac Mira Lab and Distillery, which is a favourite. We love this stream. And I'm going to add uh, Gareth onto the stream from Mac Mira as well. So, hello. Uh, Just unmuting. There we are. Hello. Sorry. <laughs> hello. I was going to say, I think I, I was trying to undo it and then it was like, oh no. No, that um, was all, but yeah. all my fault. Sorry about that. Good evening, everyone. Gareth Mac Mira. <laughs> nice to meet you, Hannah. Thanks for the invite on the show. Yeah. Really nice to be here. It's nice to meet you. I mean, I've, been a while. Um, I've, been to, uh, I've been listening to what you've been saying. It's been fascinating. Uh, some good discussion. <laughs> so we'll take those further tonight, I'm sure. Yeah. Lovely. I can talk for a while. So if anyone gets fed up with me talking, by the way, about one thing, just tell me to move on because I, I will talk for a long time. So. I think we're um, cut from the same cloth. I think that's why we're here. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. Funnily, Alex said the same thing on the Mac Mirror tasting. He, he said the same thing. Um, yeah, so if you, if any of you were um, in, on board for the Mac Mirror tasting, which I know a couple of you were, you would have met Alex from Mac Mirror, so we've got Gareth involved for this one here. Um, but yeah, we, we really enjoy Mac Mirror stuff, and um, just as our whiskey is fabulous, their gin is also great as well. Um, so I'll, I'll let, I can let Gareth sort of speak to you a little bit about their, their gin, um, and yeah, it's, we'll get, get, it, get it poured and Tasty. Yeah, I've got some of the glass uh, warming up, bizarrely. Um, <laughs> but yeah, if, if I just give a, a little bit of context, uh, of course, yeah, um, of course. Mira is a Swedish whiskey company, of course. That's why we started um, 20 years mm -hmm. ago in 1999. A, a group of friends were up together up a mountain skiing and they said, why isn't there a Swedish distillery uh, doing Swedish malt whiskey? We've got great ingredients. We've got super weather mm. for doing barley. We've got the wood for the oak. We've got great water coming down from the mountains, etc. Uh, so um, an idea was formed. And uh, in 2002, uh, the first distillery at uh, the town of McMira, the Brooks Distillery, mm. uh, was opened up. And that's where they stayed for quite a number of years, became very successful. And then they built a world leading gravity distillery, very energy efficient and um, a, a step up, a big step up in uh, volume and production. So that was 2011. And uh, the old distillery kind of went into storage and then into a bit of mothball. And um, around about 2017, um, an, an ex employee, oh, well, he is an ex employee, but he came back, a guy called Rickard Alden, came back and, and proposed an idea to reopen the lab distillery to make gin. Uh, batch gin and uh, so that's how we started making gin uh, I know a lot of um, whiskey people that make gin at the same time but we came along afterwards um, but true to a form uh, you know they wanted everything to be truly authentic and 100% organic and um, they came up with initially uh, like you mentioned earlier Hannah uh, quite a high strength gin uh, um, what they did uh, Rickard went out and he, he actually did a lot of research with the bartenders and around the community and uh, came up with quite a high sp uh, spirit gin, 47% uh, spirit. And uh, the first gin that we came out was um, with this, which was called Creator. Yeah. Oh, wrong way around. There we go. Lab Creator. I say the Creator and came out first, didn't it? That's right. The Creator came out first. Yeah, um, really. But, but then we wanted to really get involved with the uh, the Swedish System Bolleger, the um, the the uh, uh, national sort of uh, monopoly uh, commission there for for alcohol, and they wanted a whiskey and a gin. Uh, so we went and we produced uh, effectively um, uh, the lab lab distillery gin. Now this is uh, a much simpler gin, uh, but it's done uh, pretty much uh, in a similar style. So it's all it's all handcrafted basically. So mm. it's all done in batches. Um, to date, I think since 2017, 18, we've done 14 batches of of the of the lab of the lab gin. And, um, you know, at each time you've got 500 limes that are peeled by hand to get into all, all of that, uh, mm -hmm. and lemons. Um, so there's a fairly um, narrow range of botanicals compared to the uh, 17 or 16 or 17 uh, that's in uh, the creative yeah. gin. So um, that's a, 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 a simplistic and it's dialed down a bit to 40, 40 degrees. But the flavour and the intensity of this yeah. gin, is, 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 I find, is, is wonderful. And they're two different gins for two different uh, reasons, really. Um, the, 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 the powerful gin is really probably meant to be, we even created our own uh, little mixer to go with it, our own creator tonic, uh, whereas the lab gin is definitely to be the basis yeah. of some fabulous cocktails uh, to, to be going through there. Um, so we do about one and a half thousand bottles in a, in a run. And um, it's, uh, it, it's 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 incredible. So I, I've got it in my glass just to nose. Mm -hmm. I don't know if other people have it in their glass. Just I've got to a little glass and it as a gin and tonic as well. We did actually have a look for the Creator Tonic. We had some not that long ago, um, but ah, okay. we've run out of it. But it is, oh. the Creator Tonic is absolutely fabulous with the especially with the Creator Gin. Yes. Just, well, can I tell you? Um, we've just got a little summer deal on at the moment on the shop. If you buy any gin, you get some creator free. Okay. So there you oh, go. That's a bit nice. of, how, fortuitous, how fortuitous I turned up. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's um, that's that, that's quite a nice little offer. The gin uh, was made in con uh, uh, sorry, the creator tonic was made in conjunction with uh, another uh, soft drinks company in there, and it's mm. been proved to be very popular. But it's particularly matched. Um, to the creator now the lab gin is slightly more simplistic and it will it will mix with a lot a lot more level of flavors and a lot more levels of tonic orders and i saw mm -hmm. the different ranges that, that that you had there so yeah. on the nose um obviously yeah 
you always get the nice juniper splash in there. Yeah. Um, but the, the, the key note for me uh, in, in here is, is a nice ripe mango, which, which yeah. we're kind of famous for in, in, in this one. And it's a real sort of DNA root of this gin, which goes with a lot of flavors and brings out a lot of complementary flavors can go with that because it's a sweet flavor. Often you can put something mm -hmm. quite citrusy with this and it yeah. blends really well. Um, so um, tonight I, I'm going to, um, uh, in a little bit, I'll, I'll, I'll make it just a, a fairly simple gin and tonic, but uh, with a little kind of citrusy, citrusy touch, and I'll be using yeah. um, some uh, tonic water from uh, Fever Tree, uh, just the standard Fever Tree uh, one. We've, I know the Mediterranean is good. Sorry, Hannah? We've got um, London Essence with this one, but we have got Med Fever Tree Mediterranean, so if you want to try it with that, that's great. But the reason yeah. we did London Essence with this is um, because they distill it with... Um, a bit of citrus in there so they use lemon and lime peel um, and yeah. so we thought it would match quite nicely with that absolutely um, perfect you, you're, you're on exactly the right lines and the same lines that i'm going on as well because it's yeah. you really need to put some citrus in there to bring out the sweetness yeah. that's there and to, and for that to complement it um so um yeah the um uh, so the distill um it's still made in the old distillery and and mm. uh in, and in the in the old copper pot still in inside there um and so just just tasting it by itself um So yes, it, it's for forty percent. It's still got quite a bit of kick to it. Quite a lot of flavour comes through the immediate, the juniper, mm -hmm. um, the um, I, I do get coriander that sits on there. There's kind of like a spicy coriander feel to it. Yeah. And, and, and quite a long peppery finish just by itself. Yeah. But the undertone for me, the mango sits sits right right through yeah. there. Yeah. Um, I, I'm running just a couple of minutes ahead of schedule, but I'm going to go and grab my stuff from the fridge now. Yeah, so you can cover me for 30 seconds. Of course, yeah, I will. Yeah, no problem. The thing that one one of the things that we really like about this gin is when you look at the bottle, it's relatively unassuming. And you know, it's relatively sort of simple. It's an urgent delivery. <laughs> <laughs> it was um, but it always really surprises people. And price wise as well, you're looking about 30 quid for it. So, in terms of quality, and it's a really great surprising drink, we, we really enjoy it a lot. Um, last year, I did a tasting with Sheffield Uni, uh, their events team, they did like a gin night. Um, and they did, uh, we did this on like a guess, guess where the gin was from. So people like had to put a pin on the map and try and guess where it's from. And oh, people nice. were saying it's from, you know, South America. They thought it was from places in Africa. They, but they couldn't guess that they were just so baffled by it because it's it's just it's a lovely fruity gin without the fruit being the main the main kind of overpowering botanical. It's there in the background without it being like, where is this a fruit gin? Um, no, you're absolutely right, Hannah. I mean, yeah. We're looking for basic simplicity in the bottle design. It's built mm -hmm. for speed bars with a big handle, um, exactly the same as its sister uh, whiskey, the Mac. Yes. So these, yeah. these two are kind of like a matched pair uh, in, in the kind of uh, world of um, cocktail bars and, and things like this. Um, but the yeah, there was no, um, no extra expense on fancy bottles, fancy labeling, gimmicks and things like that. It was all about really good juice inside here to, 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 to go with it so um i have um i have my chilled glass here and i'm going to make just a a, a little cocktail um, i've got a couple of frozen fruits in there which are more for decoration but there's a couple of raspberries and strawberries straight from my garden uh oh, nice. doing well this year um so I, I do like to use some of those uh fresh fresh in there um that was the um the tonic water that we were talking about before yes. uh, there is the creator tonic um, as I said, you can get a few bottles of that free if you buy any gin off our website uh, at the moment. And that uh, I'm not going to use that tonight because I, I think it's more matched to the creator. It's personal taste, of course, mm -hmm. everything is. Uh, and tonight I'd just like to use um, a simple um, Indian tonic water, there, just a standard e e fever yeah. tree. But I am going to add in the citrus. Um, and I've got, um, I don't know if you can see down here on my little uh, tray. Yeah. What yeah. I've got is I've got my own little mini orange plant, which have got super citrusy little oranges on there. Oh, and uh, I've taken one off and I've cut that into corners. Uh, yeah. So what, what I'm, what I'm going to what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, dress my uh, thing with a little ice inside here. Oops. Try not to get it all over the place. <laughs> yeah, like, uh, <laughs> there we go. We've got the ice ice out there. And I'm going to. Um, squeeze the juice of these little quarters um there they go the little quarter mm -hmm. oranges um, but, but they've got an intensely um almost bitter um citrusy taste and and i think that really matches the sweetness that you get within there so two or three of those i squeeze over the ice and drop in i've then got my um 
reasonably generous measure of uh, lab, which I'm going mm -hmm. to uh, just, I don't think that's quite generous enough, to be honest. I think yeah. <laughs> I think a, a house poor is, is in order yeah. uh, for, for yeah. that. There we go. Um, give that a little time to, 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 to mix around. And then I'm going to just take my last bit and I'm just going to squeeze it around the rim, uh, around the top of it. So um, that's without any um, straw or anything, that's the essence you're going to get as you as you come, come to take it. Um, there we go with the, the fever tree tonic, uh, just straight tonic, not the um, not the two flavored ones. This is um, there's plenty of enough flavor in the gin itself to carry yeah. uh, this tonic through by itself. So um, there we go in a big bowl. Um, I, I think it looks it's looking pretty splendid um, for a summer pour. I might double those measures because <laughs> 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 yeah. you don't want to be getting up and down all the time, do you? No, um, of course not. And, course not. and um, that 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 for me, um, I'm gonna. Yeah, I've got mine oh. in. I've got mine in a wine glass because oh, okay. uh, my yeah. boyfriend and I are a bit clumsy. So we've, there's been many breakages during lockdown. So this yeah. is an excess thing because uh, my balloon glasses have unfortunately not lasted. But ah, oh, okay. And um, um, the balloon glass just happens to be more or less the same colour as the as the lab distillery thing as well. <laughs> just a pure coincidence. They're not, they're not official glasses or anything. Yeah. But, yeah. No. They, they get when, when I'm when I'm bringing that to my nose and my mouth, I can I, I'm getting a full flavour on with the citrus and the um, mango mm. coming through together at the same time uh, within within the nose. So that's all going in before I've even tasted it. It is. It is really lovely and fragrant. Oh, and that's beautiful. Um, sometimes I go a little bit of crazy and I put a tiny bit of um, hot chopped chili in the in in one or two of these things. Okay. Um, and it, you know the oil comes out um, of the, the capsicum oil comes out of those um, pretty rapidly when they're you know I, I keep frozen chilies I, I grow them in my greenhouse and yeah. if you chopped up a frozen chili and put it in a in a drink um, the oil still comes out and it forms yeah. like a kind of film on the surface so it's like a topper and and, and as you go through you get a little spicy kick and I'm a, I'm a, I'm a chili freak anyway so uh, uh, that's a, that's a variation yeah. you might want to think about putting your know, chilies in, in 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 these things as a another kind of botanical if you like yeah. um, I can see that working really well with the mango as well yes um, yes uh, the heat. The yeah, tropical the heat yeah, goes yeah. through with it really nicely, um, but not up tonight. I just thought it was quite something quite simple. Um, yeah. So there, you, so there you go. Um, it's um, it's it, it, it's uh, it's a versatile uh, uh, gin. I, I'd say the least. We we run um, every Friday night. We have a, a regular cocktail show for McMira, McMira and Friends at six o'clock. Yeah. Uh, look at our uh, on our website or on our Facebook page. And um, uh, in a week or two's time, we'll be uh, doing a, a, sp a specific gin night to go through it because it's kind of gin season, isn't it? I suppose yes, coming yeah. coming into summer. And um, on, on on top of that, we've also um, some hot news. Um, I, I've just uh, found out today, and I've just gotten today, Hannah. Um, we released a set of um, four gins. Now, the two gins you see oh, wow. on, on that on that side are the standard um, Creator and Lab. Yes. But these two are something very special indeed. These have just been released and they're called Ginsky. So these are 30 litre gins, uh, but, uh, sorry, uh, distillations that have been matured uh, for nearly eight months in whiskey barrels. Oh, nice. One, one, one maturation is in an elegant whiskey and mm -hmm. the, other, the other maturation is in a smoky whiskey. So what oh. you've got here is a bit of reverse. A lot of our whiskies we forge in barrels that have had port wine, brandy, cognac, all these different oh, kinds of drinking. elegant finishes. This time we finished the gin in our yeah. own whiskies. Um, so they're, they're very interesting and the flavours oh. are superb. These are more angled because we're actually angling these at uh, selling casks of gin. So it's a, yeah, it's, a, it's a new thing we're going into this year. So ready-made casks of gin, either elegant or smoky finished from these Ginskis. So uh, these are hot off the press. They're not, they're not available on the shop yet. And uh, I just thought I'd give you a sneak preview. Yeah, of, thank you very much for that. No, no, no problem at all. It's, it's literally so hot. I, it just arrived this afternoon from the, uh, <laughs> from the uh, couriers outside. So um, I'm, uh, I'm delighted to have these and I'm going to be having a, a little yeah. sample of them. Um, so, yeah, that's our future. Whether we whether we carry on and do an, another um, more gins in the future, I don't know. I think we've got a nice balance with the yeah. two that we have. We're covering yeah. we're covering two quite separate sectors, I think, yeah. with the 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 high strength cre uh, creator tonic. And um, if if people have had that before, they'll know exactly what I'm talking yeah. about. Uh, but the, the very versatile lab gin, which is uh, a good base for uh, for many a fantastic drink. Yeah, because I know I know reading up on it there was you know you sort of say that it, it's really great in a martini and um, in kind of quite strong cocktails as well. 
you know yeah. you can imagine that working really well with it because sometimes when i think when you have um when you're having kind of cocktails and things like that um sometimes it's you don't necessarily want the the gins that have loads of botanicals in there and they've got loads of different flavors uh, yeah. especially if you've got something that's quite simple like a martini or a negroni or something just having those quite bold flavors coming through can really make a difference to it yeah you've um, got a few key streams you can get a hold yeah. of but if you overcome if, if there's too much complexity in there to start yeah. with and then you try and make it even more complex it gets a bit muddled sometimes yeah it can so get a bit... simplicity is definitely to err uh, uh, on the side of simplicity i think yeah definitely um but yeah no we i mean as i mentioned we did have a mac mirror tasting a few weeks back um oh, okay. with and we went through all the the whiskey range as well and i know a few people were involved in that and really enjoyed it um yeah. And yeah, we we also have a write up on that as well on the blog. If anyone wants uh, any information on it as well, but yeah, of course, we... uh, is there any questions uh, either now or later? Feel mm. free to throw them up on the comments uh, yeah. uh, now or, or get in touch uh, with Hannah or myself afterwards. I'd be happy to, uh, to to field any questions on the whiskey or the gin. Um, yeah. Both of them are, are, are fabulous, and uh, I, I I'm really I mean I've been a brand ambassador now for maybe three four months, and uh, yeah. I'm, I'm just so pleased uh, to be working with Mac Mirror. It's a great story and, yeah. uh, and a great team to work with. But more importantly, great products. Um, you really know, once people taste yeah. them and they understand the recipe and the care that's gone into these things, um, it, you know, the, after that, it's not a difficult sell, really. <laughs> no, it's it's really great. I mean, to put it into context, was, we we go to sort of trade shows, like wine trade shows, every uh, every couple of months when they're when they're on, and um, not last year, the year before, Alex was at one of them. Um, he was at a, a wine trade show with Matt Mira Spirits. Okay. Um, and usually when you go to a trade show, you have to spit out because you're trying so many different wines and things that if you don't, you get very, very drunk very quickly. You'll never um, make the 10th stand. <laughs> <laughs> However, so I was going around and spotted Alex and started chatting to him. Um, and it's when you just released the apple blob, uh, oh, the right. apple whiskey. He said, hey, have a bit of this, try a bit of this. And I was just stood there drinking them all straight. Completely it's apple pie them. squared. It's, it's, it's yeah. apple, because apple's in the core DNA of what we do, but they're yeah. matured in, in, in Christian... Uh, Bruins, uh, 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 yeah. casks, uh, 25 year old stuff inside there. It's just beautiful. Do you know, we've only yeah. got a hundred bottles left of that, on, really? it, and it's all in the UK and it's nearly all gone. It's it's been a seasonal, yeah. as you say, it's been with us yeah. for about 18 months. Our seasonal range is our mid range, and that's where we yeah. do a lot of the exotic finishes. And they yeah. come and they go, new ones come in. Um, so early this year, the green tea finish, which is a fabulous yeah. concept yeah. as well, that, that, that went down really, really well. That one, yeah, and, and really um, yeah, and it's all in the recipe and the flavor, but yeah, there's only 100 apple blom left. Um, so mm -hmm. uh, you know, if, if if you like that, Hannah, you better grab one. <laughs> <laughs> it just gives you an idea of the sort of spirits, in the you know, they're, they're just very, they're very, I get, I get yeah. out of me, yes, approachable. My boyfriend takes the mick out of me for using that word when I talk about wine, but they are very approachable, they're very easy to understand, and yeah. um, they're also quite complex as well, which is what you know, which is what the gins are like as well. Yeah, it's born out of a, mm -hmm. a rigor where it's based on a recipe and it's a recipe yeah. approach and it's a trial and error to getting to the correct um, or getting to something that we think is or our chief nose officer, Angela Dorizio, thinks is uh, uh, presentable as a, as, a, as a product. And sometimes, for instance, that green tea took three mm -hmm. and a half years of development to get to market. It? Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, there's a huge story behind there and I'd love to tell you, but it takes about an hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> so we won't dwell on that, but it, it's a recipe approach designing a, yeah. um, a, a nose, a flavor, a finish, all within um, within a taking different recipes and bringing them together. Yeah. Most of our spirits are not just what's in the barrel put in a bottle. Most of what we deliver is a combination and a recipe of ingredients, other barrels, other spirits brought together, other whiskies, yeah. and blended into a recipe. So um, that's, that's, that's where when you taste something it's been through a lot of QA a yeah. lot of uh, and a lot of um, sort of development so that when it hits the market it generally will hit the spot and there's nothing offensive there's nothing going to come out and slap you in the face no. and say this is this massively pity yeah. you or anything like that it's yeah. it's a it's a blend it's, and yeah. it's, a, it's a culture across that whole line you know so yeah. it's not by accident a lot of work goes into it but yeah. uh, I'm happy to hear you say that approachable is not a bad word no <laughs> it's not it's just my boyfriend's not he likes some drinks, but he's not he's not very good with wine or anything like that. So he just he just thinks I'm being silly when I say it. But I'm not. I know I'm, I'm, I'm not about so lovely. Um skull. So yes, skull. Um so I think we might need to move on to the next one. So I've got um Paul from uh, ID Drinks 
waiting to come into the chat. So I'm going to move on to the next one. Gareth, if you want to stay along, that's great. It's up to you whether you watch. Um, put me on the background if you want, but I'll, I'm happy to watch. It's fine. It's lovely. Yeah. I'm really interested. Lovely. In this. <laughs> um, I'm just going to add Gareth into the uh, Paul. Sorry, into the um, into the the stream now. So yeah. Hello, Paul. Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> you guys are me so thirsty. <laughs> Well done, Gareth. Hi, <laughs> Paul. How are you doing? Yeah, good to see you, Gareth. Yeah, good to see you again, mate. Working with you. Uh, Sorry? Our, our, com our companies are very closely aligned. We've, Absolutely. Uh, with with we, uh, Maison Fronde, we supply rum barrels to... Um, That's right, uh, for the Caribbean. And, and, and we, we do a yeah. lot of exchange and stuff. Yeah. And Mac, Mac Mirror share our company philosophies about... Um, about local ingredients, about real duty of care in terms of distillation. And so, yeah, it's just really nice working with some some really, like, the be best companies in the business, Gav. Yeah, yes. thanks. Nice to hear, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> I I'm a, you know, I'm a rum fan as well, Paul, you know that, but I particularly enjoy the uh, the Caribbean rum and the finishes that we have in there as well. So that's... Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, absolutely. Well, well, Plantation's my, my, my like, tr true love of all yeah. the products we do. Um, but Cicero's but got a real lot of special little place yeah. in my heart because... Um, if, if I if I sort of describe this product, it's relatively similar to how you describe Mac Mirror in that um, first you have to do the context. So, so if I described um, Chateau Bonbonnet um, and Cognac where um, where we are um, based, right now um, the fields are ablaze with green foliage and all of the um, grapes are just starting to, to burst on the vines. And yeah. um, the Fron family have been toiling those fields and making Cognac for nearly 400 years now. Um, it's uh, the, the, the painting I'm trying to uh, I'm trying to put to you is is a company that that is very much about agriculture and about the, the ingredients and so for we we um, toil the toil the fields and and work on the grapes for six months of the year. You're allowed to distill cognac for just six months of the year, um, yeah. just from October through to March. And um, so very early on, when my boss Alexander Gabriel. Um, bought into the business and started managing the business. It was his intention to try and use the other six months of the year when they're not using the stills to, to really bring to life gin, which, which was very much his passion. And, and Citadel was born. Mm. And Citadel now is one of the more venerable of the premium gins on the market because this, this was the first of the sort of high-end gins that came to market 28 yeah. years now. I was going to say... Like with with the UK market, obviously, craft gin only kind of um, became really decade. popular in the last sort of, yeah last decade, last 10, 11 years. Where with you guys uh, with Citadel, you know, it started back in nineteen ninety six. So there's been well, a lot. Well, we were we we were ahead of the curve. <laughs> yeah. um, Alexander will tell you tell you a funny story of sitting with the master distiller for Beef Eater at the time, so Desmond mm -hmm. Payne, and and um they, and they were sitting drinking out in Bermondsey. And they saw um, a hearse come past, and Desmond made a joke it, around '96 time. Another customer, there goes another gin customer. <laughs> that in mid '90s, gin was an yeah. aged for aging population. Yeah. So that was the market we we, we launched gin into Citadel into, and it wasn't hugely successful at the time. We sort of predated it, but but the core principles that make Citadel special are the reason why it's endured, because at its core, this gin is just about celebrating juniper. So mm -hmm. celebrating, celebrating that wonderful aromatic, oily berry, um, and and providing a platform for the for the uh, with with alcohol and the other spices for the gin for the juniper itself to be really elevated. So so we actually have our own um, alongside the the grape fields, the vineyards. We have um, all our juniper bushes um, that are providing about fifty percent of our harvest now. Um, and um, within about sort of three or four years, we'll get we will grow 100% of our juniper because, of course, right. the sourcing the actual ingredient and, and creating it ourselves mm. is really core to our, to our, our ideals. So, first things first. Th there's 19 botanicals in Citadel. 70-75% of it, in terms of weight, is juniper. 15 to 20% is citrus that's there to elevate and and provide. Um, um, uh, an uplift to the juniper and then only five to ten percent are the other aromatics and, yeah. and we, we approach our botanicals in much the same way that a chef would um approach using seasoning not to mask your raw ingredient if you've got a great steak you don't want to load it with the heavy yeah. heavy spices what you want is to is the right amount of seasoning to, that makes a steak taste better and the way way we make it is quite interesting because um 
it, it, it's, it's interrelated to how we would we would approach something like cognac. First things first, um, that each of those botanicals are either or either more alcophilic or hydrophilic, meaning they they are soluble even more in alcohol than yeah. water. Oh, yeah. And so so over four days, what we do is we start with a um, with an eighty five percent wash to which we add the the heavier oilier components, so the juniper in particular, um, some of the citruses. Um, and then what we do is we progressively dilute that um, wash and introduce the botanicals at their prime time so they can be infused over the yeah. four days. So the very final components we put in are the hydrophilic um, light floral components like violet, for example, yeah. which actually yeah. isn't very soluble in, in alcohol, but it's very soluble in water. And so yeah. then what, we, what we've got is a, is a wash that, that, that contains all of the best components of each of those botanicals with juniper being very much the hero mm. of that. Then we put it into the cognac stills. That's really important. Cognac stills, unlike um, more, more sort of industrial columns, are, have a very yeah. low neck. Stills, aren't they? That's right. And very importantly, with cognac making, you have to apply a direct flame to the base of the still. Yeah. And what happens is, um, because we only lightly filtered our wash, the um, the wash inside the still is actually full of um, sugars and oils still that, that have come off of the, uh, each of the botanicals. And when you apply a, a direct flame to the base of the still, the first few millimetres go up to 900 to 1000 degrees C. And what happens at that temperature is exactly the same process that happens when you sear a steak on a red hot grill. Yeah. It's what's called a Maillard reaction. Um, yeah. What happens is sugars and amino acids fuse together and you get these other flavor compounds forming in a wash. And so you suddenly get all these other flavor components that, that bind together the aromatics of Citadel. And then really importantly, because it's a low neck still, mm -hmm. a lot of the oils vaporize and end up in the distillate. And so when you get the final product, yeah. the first thing you'll notice if you, if you pour Citadel on its own is it's incredibly oily when you swirl it in a glass. Because it's, it's quite literally got, it's quite literally got juniper oils, citrus oils in it. Um, that if you used a more modern process like a, um, a column still with plates, it would be simply yeah. impossible to get. But which would really add to the mouthfeel and really add to the taste and texture. So once we've distilled that, so, so um, the, I, I should have mentioned the, the wash is, is a wheat ba wheat based neutral yeah. grain spirit. Um, which means you get a little bit aniseedy touched with it. But um, I, I was pleased to see when Gareth was talking about that the, uh, Matt Mirror do a sort of a higher ABV gin because mm. it's one of my constant sources of disappointment because I, I travel around the world a lot with this job and it's, it's a constant source of disappointment that this country thinks of itself as the home of gin and yet most gins that we're exposed to are watered down versions of what the distillers actually intended. Yes, yeah. Because the proof of that is if you go to a low taxation company, a country like the US, um, yeah. Beef Eater, Bombay Sapphire, Gordon's, they're all not paying, yeah. 40, 44, 47%, 46%. Because at that ABV, you've got more grip of the alcohol to bind yeah. together the aromatics. You've got more solvency from the alcohol itself. So it's not about getting drunker faster. It's about quite literally having supercharging the flavours in your glass. Mm. Um, I mentioned earlier, just before you guys uh, kind of joined in, about the death's door as well, because that's bottled at 47%. There you um, go. And with it only being three botanicals in there, you think, oh, it's not going to be very complex, but there's a lot of flavour in it because, you know, alcohol is a carrier of flavour. So that's why sometimes when you get, you know, your big cask whiskies, uh, cask brand whiskies, and they're bottled at, say, 60%, you think, God, that's intensely strong. How am I going to drink that? But you actually get a lot more flavour coming through with that. Um, and there's a couple of gins that I've had, you know, made in the UK that, that use that do a navy strength. I uh, know like places right. like Manchester Gin and Tarquins. And their navy strength ones are actually, in my opinion, better than then the signature styles because there's just so much more flavour in there as well. So when you start mixing it and you put a tonic in there, they've got they've got much more power to stand up to it. So you get the flavour coming through a little bit more. Um, You're absolutely right. You don't, you don't you aren't required to drink it at a higher ABV. You can dilute it slightly more, yeah. but it will still taste more flavoursome because there was more flavour in the base liquid. You you can't mm. if at forty percent, it can't carry as much as it could do. Mm. We 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 do ours at forty four. Yes. Um. That's that's just right for our balance. And and the way we get there is um after we distill, 
we then spend a period of three weeks gradually diluting down to bottling strength, okay. adding 3% at a time. Because the idea, you were quite right, Hannah, when you said yeah. that alcohol is an incredible uh, solvent of flavours, if you add water or a tonic to a gin, what happens is all of those flavours locked in the alcohol explode out like a firework. Mm. And it's wonderful when you've got your nose over them because yeah. you, you're the recipient of all that, all that wonderful whoosh of flavour. But if, what happens if, if you dump water into a gin when it's before it goes into a bottle, what happens is that firework goes off prior to anyone actually receiving it. Yeah. So, so what we do is very softly introduce the water um, in order to try and keep as much of the um, flavor compounds locked inside the alcohol. So we only, do, we only ever want to dilute 3% of the volume at a time. And we do that over a process yeah. of seven weeks. That's an interesting way of doing it. I didn't realize you guys did it that way, uh, that you do it yeah. so actually. Um, well, and one con oh. Cognac, we spend years getting down to bottling strengths. Oh, yeah, so it's, course, it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's one of those sort of things that, that's intrinsic to what we yeah. do. Uh, one of the things that's good that I like about Citadel as well is you, when you're talking about the juniper as well, um, obviously when you're drinking wine and things like cognac as well, there's, there's a sense of what's called the terroir, which is the, the environment in which the botanicals or the grapes are grown in. Um, and you find that when you start drinking wines or different spirits from around the world, you do get like different senses of terroir and different senses of um, how they're grown. And um, you can, to some extent, people ask, oh, can you taste can you taste the difference in an organic wine? And you might not be able to sort of side by side taste the difference, but if you're used to drinking organic wine and then go to drinking non-organic, you kind of notice the difference. Mm -hmm. So in Citadel with them, you know, there's a sense of terroir in that as well with the juniper. It's this idea that the junipers come from that particular area and cognac is known for, for cognac, obviously, um, but they grow some really great fruit there, some really great um, fruit for, for the cognacs they grow you know, great grapes, but also some other really interesting um, flora and fauna and things like that, which work really well in, in the gin. And you, you get a sense of a sense of, of place in it, which I think yeah. is always, always nice. I, I think that's really key. Yeah. I mean, and, and we're we're sort of taking that to the next level. So it's our intention in the next decade to grow 100 percent of all of our botanicals mm. that we use in our gin at, our, at that site. Not. Yeah. Not for any other reason, not necessarily for marketing reasons. I don't necessarily think that anyone will buy a single, any additional bottles. Mm. It's really to do with our sense of place as farmers. Yeah. That we, we get the degree of control and the sense of satisfaction of making it yeah. by doing it all ourselves. And so we will try and hothouse our citruses and yeah. and, and our co coriander and whatnot. Um, and cause, cause, because it's that's who we are. It gives you a little bit more scope for, um, you know, like for experimentation as well and a bit more scope to kind of, you know, look at how you use your own botanicals and how you kind of put them into something. Um, right. You know, because if you're exporting stuff in, um, you know, I mentioned earlier about gin being global and we, we get botanicals from all over the world. But when you're sort of exporting it in, you're kind of limited as to what you can or can't do with them. Sometimes they might come in dried, so you have to use them in a dried format, or sometimes they might be That's right. you're using quite quickly. And you get so, big variations, and yeah. you're, you're subject to, to, to the supply chain. Yes. Um, I was interested in, um, Gareth, you were talking about your aged products, and um, yeah. that's, something, that's something that we've been doing for a very long time. Mm -hmm. um, as, as, as I said before, a natural extension to us is making cognac. And so we, we at the Citadel Reserve, um, we um, we age um, the gin in six different types of barrels um, uh, that that encompass um, Pinot de Charente, um, Sauterne barrels, um, and some of our cognac barrels. Yeah. And then we blend it all in this quite incredible device um, called a marrying egg, um, which is a which is a twelve foot tall egg shaped wooden barrel. And, wow. and the, the point the point of having an egg shape is that it's the perfect shape for the natural convection that happens when, when yeah. liquid expands in the heat of the day and it contracts Very liquid down. And yeah. so, so if, you, if you if you put particulate matter inside this barrel, um, the natural um, con uh, sort yeah. of convection, the heat convection, will, will circulate it evenly through the barrel. And the whole point of using that barrel is that we marry all of these um, the gin uh, aging these different barrels together. Um, and then we take that to the next step was we also do an old Tom where we age um, toasted sugars um, for a number of months. So we, we quite literally alkalize 
sugars with gin, age it in barrels, and then we introduce that to our aged products as well. So um, it's, it's, it's an interesting range and they are yeah. very much labors of love. And so, so I really want to thank you for letting us get a chance to tap, chat about it. No, it's really nice. I mean, it is a little bit odd doing um, virtual tasting. So obviously when you do a tasting, you know, uh, you, you sit, see the room, you see how people are enjoying it. And all that Well, but, smiles. Um, <laughs> yeah. But it, it, is, it is nice as well doing it this way because it means that we can quite easily, you know, connect people to people as well. And, um, you know, give people a bit more, a bit more idea of the, the, you know, behind the product. So, yeah, it, we, we appreciate you very much coming on. Uh, I know there's, there's quite a bit at the moment, um, um, one of the, the two gins that I'm about to do, unfortunately, they couldn't get anyone to join in because uh, of obviously furloughing and things like that. But it, it's really nice. I would. Yeah, so, so I'd just like to um, just to put point in there and totally agree with Paul about yeah. the terroir and the locale. We're we're fortunate uh, up in Sweden where we are um, in in the Gavle, uh, in the east coast that uh, juniper is in plentiful local supply, um, yeah. and, and and better than that. So yeah. we got lots of juniper berries, but we when. Um, because all the, when they run the electricity pylons through all year round, they're constantly cutting down the clippings of juniper. So we use that juniper um, to as a base layer, one percent base layer on our uh, peat to do our yeah. smoking. And the difference that that, that gives the smoky wood flavour yeah. that comes through on it is absolutely we, essential. We it's, did uh, that. It's we, a real we, terroir. We we launched a um a a one of a kind um. Uh, it was just a, a technical project called um, Season of the Witch, where we took juniper berries um, and then we smoked them use um, over burnt juniper wood. Ah. To, 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 so they got infused with the smoke flavour into the berries themselves before we then distilled them. Um, right. it's, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, it never went into general release. I don't think it's really for everyone's palate, but for a okay. connoisseur, it was a, it's a one-off. You, you can only buy it at the Chateau. When having went, having said that though, when we did the Mac Mira tasting, the Spence Rock, which is the the one that the rock, they yeah. that you use the the juniper in, is is one of the favourites. And yeah. um, in terms of whiskey, I enjoy whiskey. I can drink it, but I wouldn't necessarily choose it to drink a lot of. Um, and I wouldn't necessarily choose, you know, like the big peaty ones. So you know, because I, I remember working in bars and someone would order an Ardberg, and you'd open the bottle, you could smell it across the other side of the room. It's just that yeah. massively overpowering, like medicinal smell which you know, obviously some people love which is great yeah. but, and it's incredible that one percent in the mix of the juniper um yeah. dials down the smoke completely well the, yeah. the acid is taken out and it goes more to a campfire kind of smoke a soft yes. melt smoke rather than a harsh peat yeah. you know um, and that's something is, i found i really enjoy I, I like that sort of like you say campfire like bonfire sort of style of smoke and the thing that was interesting about the the spence rock if you're not perhaps a whiskey drinker but you do enjoy gin it might be something to try maybe try if you wanted to look in getting in getting into whiskey because you've got the juniper in there it gives it a really lovely tiny freshness as well so it's, it's an interesting way of doing it um and yeah there's i mean gin, people say about gin going oh it's really popular surely the bubble will burst but there's actually a lot that you can do with it um and there's a lot well, that I it think, kind of mixes I think, I think the important thing is, is 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 the core principles will endure like well-made yeah. gins that have a sense of place and yeah. um, and really deliver a great experience is timeless some of yeah. some of the sort of the, the more trivial brands that are moving further away from gin, so they're less about juniper. Sweet Valley are, 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 in a, are in a slightly different different no, realm, yeah. let's say. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. Think. Like, Hannah, Hannah, can you put me in contact with Gareth? Um, and I'd like to meet you for a drink at some point, Gareth. Absolutely, um, yeah. like my kind of lot. people. <laughs> yeah. um, and I'm looking forward to getting to Sheffield soon. I'll, I'll come and drink at the bar. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know where you where you're based, Paul. I'm I'm in Milton Keynes, so in uh, post lockdown, if we're not, not really miles, miles away. I'm in West. I'm in West London. I've got a I've got a rum bar just around the corner from here. Um, called Trailer Happiness. Trailer which, Happiness, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, I know it well. I've never been there, but I, I do know it well. It's famous, one of the, or is it infamous? <laughs> I'm one of the owners of Trailer. So um, oh, so okay. next uh, next time you're coming to Notting Hill, it's just, yeah. just around the corner from my house, then uh, oh, put, put, yeah, Keep put in me mind. up and we'll go for a drink. Yeah. Absolutely. If anybody's ever in, in London, there you go. You've got a perfect drinking place. Perfect <laughs> it's a date in the diary. I'm writing it down. <laughs> yeah, hopefully, hopefully we'll be able to, you know, come down soon. Um, but we'll, we'll just have to wait and see. Hopefully things pan out okay <laughs> for that. But, yeah, no, I, I want to say that, thank you so much for you both being on. Um, yeah, it's really great to have really great to have a conversation uh, kind of going with it as well. Um, and Kirsty's mentioned, somebody watching, that 
they're both really delicious gins and you know so thanks as well for the really informative chat so I'm going to get something to eat and start hard drinking. So, um, <laughs> yeah. the rest of your tasting. Thanks, yeah. to Kat, Thanks, Gareth. Thank you very much, Paul. It was lovely to, to meet you. Take, take <laughs> Thank Bye, you. Guys. Thanks, bye. Um, Gareth, are you, are you happy to stay on for a little bit and go in? Yeah, 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 why not? Have we, have we got one more to go, is it? Uh, two more to go. If you want, to, if you don't want to stay on, that's, that's perfectly fine. I, well, I do have a partner who's waiting for me, so um, I've got that's five shows good. in in four days at the moment. So <laughs> <laughs> it's a that's busy time. Nice. You know, it's a yeah. busy time, but you know, really appreciate you um, giving me the opportunity yeah. to come on here. And you know, I've known Paul in other circles. I've seen him in other circles for a while. But it's nice to have a face to face with somebody. And uh, so, a great networking opportunity. Yeah. I hope it goes well. And a, a great I adventure. Kids. I'm certainly going to try the Citadel. Uh, yeah. That's certainly a bit of an eye opener. And uh, now I know the story behind it. I'll I'll be seeking that out. So once yeah. again, Anna, thanks very much indeed. Thank and, you, uh, hope Gareth, goes well. appreciate it. Thank you very okay. much. Bye Thank bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye everyone. Bye. So yeah, that was Citadel and Black Mirror, and they're both two really great brands that we we really love. So we're going to move on to the next one now, um, and the next one is a really interesting one. So it's this one, the Kanema Gym. Um, and this one, I'm excited to tell you about this because there's lots behind it as well that that uh, make it a really really great gin, other than just the gin in the bottle. Um, so this one is from South America. Now, I say South America, they make it in Venezuela, but they actually use botanicals from the Amazon in it, which is something really unusual. And one of the things we often get about um, when people come into the store, they ask and they go, oh, um, I really want, you know, I just want a gin that's something a bit different. And with gin, it's quite hard to sort of say, well, what, you know, what do you want in terms of what's different? Sometimes people really love local gins. So they like the things that they know exactly where it's come from. Um, and they might go for a certain flavour profile in that. Sometimes they just want something quite out there. Um, and I always think that this is a really good one if you're looking for something different because this is incredibly unusual. I don't think there's anything like this in, on the market. I don't think there's anything that I've ever come across that uses uh, botanicals from the Amazon. And there's some really, really in kind of unusual botanicals in there, some incredibly different styles of botanicals that make for a really interesting type of gin. So there's, there's quite a story behind this as well. Um, and the next two gins, are, there's quite a bit of story behind both of them. So I apologize if I'm going on a little bit, but there's a lot to sort of cover with, with these two gins. Um, so I'm just gonna get my notes up to make sure I don't miss anything. So as I said, this, this one is made in Venezuela and this is made in the distillery um, where they make Diplomatico rum. So if you know if you're a rum fan or if you've come across it before, Diplomatico is a really popular, really quite famous rum. Uh, it's a little bit sweeter in its style, really, really delicious. Um, and it's made at the dis it's called the Distilleras Unidas in South America. Um, so this is where it's made. Um, but they work really closely with um, communities and charities that help the indigenous tribes in uh, in the Amazon which make it really interesting as well. So that what's great about this is that 10% of its sales go to both go to saving go to both saving the Amazon and to projects that help um, help indigenous people uh, in the Amazon. And it's as I say it's something completely different and unusual because there's 19 botanicals in there in total, eight of which are from uh, are traditional botanicals like the your traditional gym ones so you, your juniper your coriander seed citrus and things like that uh, there's one from venezuela from where the distillery is which is the bottom of the andes uh, mountains um, and then there's 10 different botanicals from the amazon now a lot of the things from the amazon i've put on the screen here on the presentation you can see what which some of them are so there's things like i think it's apologize for any pronunciation it's mary which is mary from uh, the fruit of the cashew tree, akai, uh, sege, uh, which is the fruit of a palm of a sege palm tree, so different to a sort of coconut or anything like that. Uh, Eufa de palma, uh, tupria, which is a bit like um, almost like a citrus as well, um, and copper zulu, which is uh, belongs in the same family as cocoa, and the, um, they use different parts of the fruit. Um, um, for distilling because the, the seeds are used for making co um, chocolate um, and things like that. So there's some really interesting botanicals in there. And, you know, when I was doing, doing some research on it, the, 
one of the things in the Amazon, there's something like 3,000 different fruits or so, um, and about 200 or so that you know we we're probably aware of. But the people that live in the Amazon, the indigenous people, they really have a great knowledge and they have a really um, in-depth knowledge of what grows where and how it grows and things like that. So it's really important that these guys, you know, they decided it is important that they really work closely with them because one of the things with um, getting botanicals from somewhere like the Amazon is you're kind of limited in how much you can get. So we know obviously we were talking before about how you can bring botanicals in all over the world, etc. Um, and you are sort of limited and if you are, say, in the UK exporting things in, um, or if you're growing them yourselves, you've got much more scope for experimentation. But these are really quite limited, the botanicals, and it's because they're seasonal um, and they can only be harvested by certain people at certain times. So immediately, it's not an easy gin to make. You know, you, you, a ton of the botanicals are not easily acquirable. But it doesn't mean that they won't, you know, they won't do it. And they, they work closely with, uh, with suppliers that work to make sure that everything's done sustainably. Um, because obviously the Amazon is very, you know, it needs protecting. Um, but yeah, it's a really interesting gin, this one. So a gin that sort of does good as well, which is, you know, always great. If something does good as well as tasting good, that's always really nice. Um, and it's an easy way to sort of support support things like the Amazon as well. Um, so a little bit more on the sort of charities that they work with. Um, there's two, as I mentioned, two different charities. One called Saving the Amazon, which, let me find my notes, are an organisation that, um, that basically help uh, reforest the Amazon. So what happens is that um, they work with indigenous communities. They give them the resources to plant trees. So a tree will be planted. They photograph it and make... Um, like make a geotag of it they upload it onto their website um, and they kind of create this virtual forest um, and then it gets photographed every six months over a 36 month period um, and during that 36 month period there's people that are there looking after us uh, looking after it um, and kind of looking to to you know keep it up and running make sure it's growing healthy and things like that as well so, over 36 months um, if you if you choose to adopt a tree, you'll see it grow um, and hopefully see it thrive as well. And these really help, you know, help communities and things like that. So through this through this project, it helps communities and helps them um, with more sustainable jobs and things like that. Um, so, yeah, it's really interesting. You can adopt, adopt a tree, which is great, which I think I might go and do later. Um, and so 10 percent of uh, Canema's sales go directly to this project, which is really great. So. It's something that they're, they're really conscious about. Um, and one of the other things when I was reading up on it is that in terms of sustainability, they, they, you know, they go right down to the very minor details or the very small details. So the paper on the bottle is all um, F F F FCS approved. I think that's weird. Um, but it's all uh, sustainable paper. They, they work with, like I said, they work with um, the people that, uh, people of the Amazon, they um, the people that are craft makers there, and they do lots of say weaving and things. They they use they uh, use those people um, to make their PSO. So they'll do things like uh, ice buckets or baskets and things like that. Coasters they're all made with plants from the Amazon um, and made by my by usually women of the Amazon as well. So that there's there's a lot of links in it to really help support the people there. Uh, to ensure that they can, you know, get the botanicals that they want and they need, um, and they do it in the, the best way possible. Um, the other project that they work with, uh, Tierra Viva, which is a non non profit organisation, and they are, they support development, um, you know, support sustainable development and help create sustainable jobs. They help create education programs, cultural promotion, um, and they promote, you know, promote preventative health things like that. And um, so they. So can aim a collab closely with them to make sure that the jobs that they're they're supplying are sustainable and that they're they're working in the right conditions that they're not overly dangerous or anything like that as well. So it's really good to see that there's a you know obviously there are gins out there that are you know conscious of their 
of their footprint. And it's really good to see when there's, especially one that kind of really is really focused on it and make sure that things are done properly. Um, and the thing is, unfortunately, with with having to count them into small bottles, you don't get any of the lovely labeling or anything, but there isn't actually an awful lot on it to say, this is what we do. This is, you know, just sort of shout about it. Um, it does, it, you you know, when you do the research into it, you can see that that's what they're doing, but there's nothing that sort of says, look at us, we donate to charity and things like that, which I think sometimes is nice because sometimes you see things that go, oh, look, we're, we're doing great stuff. We're donating to charity, but, you know, this is, for them, it's kind of woven into how they make the spirit. They, they have to do, they want to do it properly, so they have to do it in the correct way. Um, and then they, you know, they, they've released the spirit, which is excellent. So in terms of actually tasting it, as, as Michelle said, it's incredibly complex, incredibly complex. And it's really interesting, really interesting gin. As I mentioned earlier, it's one of those ones that if people want something different, that this is kind of the one we, we suggest really, because there is nothing like it. It's made in, in small batches, in 500 litre batches. Um, and each of the botanicals are distilled separately. So, you know, if we add that up, we're looking at what, nearly 20 different botanicals, aren't we? That they distill separately. And then they blend it together to make a sort of complex style. And like, you know, on the nose, it's really complex. There's all sorts going on in it. But it's quite aromatic, a little bit floral. And then neat. You get that sort of little bit of spice, a little bit of citrus in there. It's quite citrus actually, quite a lot of citrus and a very citrus finish. But not your kind of usual citrus as well, which makes it really interesting. Um, so I'm just gonna make it into a gin and tonic. Now the tonic we've used for this one, there's two that you could use. So if you have some of the fever tree left, uh, try it with that, that would be good with it. Or the recommended serve for this is actually uh, a gin and grapefruit soda. Um, but unfortunately, we didn't have any grapefruit soda. We used to have one from Thomas Henry, which was great. Um, unfortunately, we ran out. But if you, yeah, if you can get your hands on some, you can try it with that. But otherwise, for the purpose of the tasting, obviously, uh, we're going to use double Dutch. As I mentioned earlier, they use grapefruit in it, so it makes for a really nice gin and tonic in that sense. I've got my grapefruit peels here as well. And the grapefruit peel, as I mentioned at the very beginning, peels just help it, stop it from being too overpowering. Sometimes if you use um, a full wedge, like a grapefruit wedge and something like this, with it being such a complex gin and there's so much in there, if you use a grapefruit wedge, you, you run the risk of overpowering it a little bit. So, you know, garnishes are one of those things that people, People sometimes like to go really over the top with and they'll go with all these crazy fancy garnishes. Sometimes people like to keep it really simple. Um, and it's just it's up to you how you do it. But I would say I would always think about it um, when you're when you're thinking of garnishing it a gin. This is why it's really good to try things neat because you know you get you get a little bit more more of an idea of the complexity of it and what's going on in it. Um because sometimes you might put something in and it will go over the top. So yeah, I'm gonna use the double dutch for this. Because uh, I think it'll go really well. And I just realised as well, it's lime that I need to put in it. Sorry, I'm not concentrating there. <laughs> so I've put, I've put both grapefruit and lime in it. Um, if you are doing it as a grapefruit, um, as the recommended serve, which is a grapefruit soda, it's just lime to use in it. But I think the grapefruit will work in it as well. It helps add to it, so. See, for me now, that's gone really quite savoury. And then the, the citrus starts to come out a little bit more. But yeah, hmm. it's such an unusual gin, but it's quite full as well in the mouth and something just really different, um, which I think which I think is what a lot of people, people want. Um, you know, as, as, as we've mentioned before about the gin market, there's hundreds of gin and we've, you know, we said there's about 6,000 in the world. But unfortunately what that does is it can 
overcrowd the market. Um, and this is where that kind of rumor of, oh, the gin bubble's gonna burst soon. It's not gonna be available anymore. Nobody's gonna be drinking gin, et cetera. It's gonna burst. It, it could do, but one of the things that people we're finding with people with gin is that they're going back to really well-made things. And if they do want something different, it's things like this sort of thing where there's a really interesting complexity in there or perhaps something like the Citadel where there's a lot going on in it or the Mac Mirror where it's a little bit more simple but it's a bit more unusual. Um, so, you know, we, we do try to make sure that the, the gins we stock are are interesting as well um, because, you know, there's it gets to a point where you want to try different things but there's always going to be certain ones that, you know, you kind of come back to. Um, and for World Gin Day, I wrote an article on our blog about uh, some of our favorite gins so if you want to have a look at that I'll, the link's in the, the description um and you know sort of asking Jeff Barry and Sarah and then writing about myself my sort of favorite gins and things like that there's always ones that we have kind of soft spots for which we've noticed so Barry he really likes mermaid gin uh, from the Isle of Wight which he's met been there and met them before and things like that for me I really love things like forest gin um because it's one of the first kind of craft gins that we tried so there's always going to be sort of gins that we we always go back to and that are always going to be favourites. Um, but in terms of when people come in and asking, looking for something different, we like to think as well, we have got a really interesting range of things that are, are more unusual, but are also really well made that aren't just kind of like overpowering kind of fruit gins. But yeah. Hmm. Really unusual. Yeah, so it makes for a really different type of gin and tonic, that one, a little bit more unusual um, and a little bit different. So yeah, really glad, really glad that we showed you that. Um, it is also bottled as well. We are talking before about the strength, it is also bottled at 47%, so it's quite high in alcohol, um, but that really helps carry the, the botanicals and the flavour over. And it also helps give it a slightly creamier finish as well, uh, which is really nice. Um, I'm just gonna touch Briefly, I think I've got everything from that. Yeah, just checking I've got everything on that because um, I mentioned about them being sort of sustainable. Um, but yeah, they 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 do everything everything really sustainable. So if you're if you're looking for something that is within that realm, hey, this is this is probably the gin gin for you. I'm really glad people enjoy this as well because we, it's relatively new to the market. It's not been out that long. Um, so I'm glad that people are enjoying this and they're finding it finding it good because um, I think sometimes you can, it could be one of those that people look at and go, "What you from the Amazon? Is that a bit of a gimmick?" But it's it's not. It's really really not. So I'm, I'm glad I'm glad you guys are enjoying it. Um, lovely. And then we're going to move on to the last gin in the lineup. So the last gin is the Nico Coffee Gin, which is this one. Now, before anybody gets carried away, it is not gonna taste like coffee. It's got nothing to do with coffee in terms of like the thing we drink in the morning to wake us up. Um, Nikka coffee gin, the coffee actually refers to the type of still. So uh, Gareth was saying about the Citadel, it's, they use a cognac still, which is like a big, big pot, um, quite short and stout. Um, with this one, it's the opposite, so they use, really big tall uh, stills and it's two big columns as well um, and the name coffee comes from the the guy that invented it so it was a guy called Andreas Coffee, coffee and he was uh, an Irishman and he developed this still I think it was in like the 1830s or so so quite old old technology uh, obviously been refined since then but he developed this still which allows for a continuous distillation so what happens is the the mash um, or the the neutral spirit gets put through the uh, still. Um, it gets heated up. It it's cold as it goes in. It gets heated up, and as it goes up into the second column, the steam comes through, and then it goes back into the other column. It cools it down and condenses. Anything that doesn't get cooled down goes back round again. So you get quite a sustainable way of making um, making the spirit. Um, and a coffee still was developed. Uh, for efficiency obviously it meant that you know you're not wasting stuff um 
It was also developed for spirits that are higher in alcohol and spirits that you want to be purer. So things like vodka, um, if you look at if you look at sort of distillation, when you're looking at vodka, things like that, it's often done in a column still because you get a much higher strength in alcohol and you also get purer, um, a purer liquid coming through from it, which for vodka, it's what you want. You want a really clean, pure spirit. Um, you're sh in vodka, usually you're showcasing the base spirit. So whether that's a neutral grain spirit or whether you use, say, potatoes to make that spirit or uh, wheat or whatever you use to make it, you know, that's that's the kind of, um, that's what you want from, from vodka. You want to show that purity. So it works really well for spirits like that. And it also works well for gin as well in certain circumstances. Um, if you're wanting a cleaner, purer gin, then you will get that from, from using a column still. Now, Nikka though is, Nikka is a Japanese company and the Japanese are quite kind of meticulous. They like to do everything really, uh, like to do it in really kind of set ways. Um, so it's quite a complex gin in how they make it. Um, so what they do with this gin, they take both corn and malt and they put them through the coffee still separately. So they distill the corn through the coffee still to make a corn distillate. And they do the they do the same with the malt to make a malt distillate. What they do then is they have three sets of botanicals. Um, it's a little bit small on the screen here. You can't quite see it properly, but there is the diagram on the screen. Um, but I will, I'll put that up afterwards. Uh, I'll put it on, on the write-up we do um, afterwards. So you'll be able to have a look at it a bit better. Um, and if you if you if needs be, I can always send it over as well. Um, so what they do is they separate each of the botan uh, the botanicals into different groups, and there I think there's about seven botanicals in Nika. Just sheet. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eleven, twelve botanicals. Sorry, um, but they're separated into different types so you get things you get the sort of um classic gin botanicals like juniper angelica root um coriander seed etc then you get things like the citrus and they use a lot of japanese citrus in there so you things like yuzu they use things uh like kaposu as well and things like that and then they use sancho pepper so each of these are separated into three and then they're left to macerate in the in the corn <laughs> it's okay guys <Kirsty. laughs> i do it a lot and i'm also st stumbling my words a bit if i uh, ever get a bit like that sometimes uh, my brain thinks too fast and then i come out with things and i can't speak um but anyway they, so they they then take botanicals and they let them macerate in the the two different distillers um from that they then redistill everything but they don't just sell it together, they keep it all separate. So it's in three different sets. Um, and the, the pepper and the citruses are done in what's called a vacuum still. Now a vacuum still essentially takes all the air out of it and makes the temperature lower, uh, watch, uh, makes the temperature lower in the still. So it means that you keep a lot of the freshness in there, which is really important for this gin. So I'm just gonna pour a little, a little dram out. So when you have this neat, it's you get that lovely sort of hint of citrus, like burst of citrus. Sorry, it, it's quite bold and the citrus on there. It also smells a little bit sweeter in style. Now that is for a particular reason because they use corn in there, um, and they're not just using say wheat or uh, a neutral grain spirit. Because they're using corn, it adds a bit of a richer, kind of slightly creamier, buttery feel to it which is, it makes, makes quite a difference to it. And needs as well, it's got, it's, it's almost, it's really interesting. You get that sort of spice coming through from the pepper, but it's also slightly sherbety as well. Like that really, almost like lemony, in between lemon and grapefruit sort of sherbet, which, which is what you is use, it's kind of in between those two different fruits. So, as a gin, it's actually very, very soft, and you can drink this neat. Now, Nicker are actually a whiskey company, so that's probably why drinking neat 
it, it's it's not offensive or anything like that. It's really actually quite pleasant. Nicker, um, as you can probably see from the slide, it was started started by um, the founding father of Japanese whiskey, uh, Matasaka Takasuru. So he was born in 19, uh, 19, sorry, 1894. Um, he was born into a, a, brewer, a family that uh, did brewing. So he was automatically kind of within the industry. Um, he studied it in, um, in Japan where he was born. I think he was born in Hiroshima, I think. Um, and then, yeah, so he studied brewing and then he went to Scotland in 1918. So he went there to study, uh, studied at the University of Glasgow and he did apprenticeships at a couple of really known, uh, well-known whiskey distilleries, places like Longmorn and Hazelburn, uh, Hazelburn being in Campbelltown. Um, and being part of the Springbank group, which I know we might have one or two people watching who are very, very big fans of Springbank. Um, so, you know, he, he spent a long time researching and learning from some of the best out there. So he went out there in 1918, went back to Japan in 1920. Um, he married a, a Scottish woman called Rita, and they went back there and they decided to start working on making a Japanese whiskey. So at this point, he'd started working with a company called Suntory, which make Yamazaki whiskey, they make Hibiki whiskey. If you've ever had Roku at uh, the Roku Gym, which is the one in the hexagonal bottle, that's made by them as well. Um, so we started working with them and working on the first Japanese whiskey, which was from the Yamazaki distillery, um, which was a brand new distillery. Um, he left there in 1934 and then he started Nikka. So Nikka first started making whiskey, uh, I think they first distilled in 1936, I've got down, um, and they have their first distillery in Yoichi, which is in the very north of Japan. So if you fast forward about 30 years or so, they then decide to build a distillery in the south of Japan as well, uh, which is a Mikiago. And there's two different styles of whiskey that come from these, and two different styles of kind of spirits from there. The Yoichi tends to produce a little bit more peaty styles of whiskey. The Mikiago is usually where you get the softer styles and it's where they make all of these, all of the coffee ones. Um, because they have, they had a coffee still brought over um, in the 1960s and then that was moved to that distillery in the 1990s. Um, so yeah, it's a really, it's an interesting sort of style of, of gin. Um, I mean, the one thing that when people are buying, say, Japanese whiskey is that they don't necessarily kind of always realise is that Japanese whiskey is usually always blended. Um, and when you think about blended whiskey, you think of things like grouse or bells and things like that. And people kind of automatically dispel them for being not that great. But the Japanese have a really, really specific way of blending. And as I said, they're quite very sort of particular. They like to make sure it's very, it's done perfectly. And that shows with the gin as well, because as it comes through, you know, you're getting all these kind of different complex flavours coming through, which is really interesting. Now, I've still got a bit of gin left from my little one, so I'm just going to make a small gin and tonic in this glass, my little glass. Yes. Um, uh, the tonic that we've decided to put with this one is the Double Dutch, which again, as mentioned, it's got the grapefruit in there. Um, and we've decided some grapefruit peel in it, which would work quite nicely in there as well. It would also work really well with pink peppercorns in this. Um, but as I say, pink peppercorns aren't necessarily the easiest thing to get hold of. So, um, yeah, and my grapefruit peels just these little things, don't look particularly nice. I'd love to know how Barman managed to make them look really pretty. But when I was peeling them earlier today, it just wasn't going as well. But anyway, as long as it tastes good, that's the thing that's important. So it's, as I mentioned, neat, it's really aromatic and you get that really lovely sherbet yuzu, yuzu coming through, citrus, but an gin and tonic. It's really quite delicate and soft. It's one of those that sort of, the more you drink, the more kind of comes through on it. Um, but it has got a really lengthy finish as well. I don't know if anyone, if you're drinking it, 
You can still taste it slightly on the back of the tongue. It's just got a slight, slight lift still. But yeah, it makes for a really soft kind of finish. So, you know, hopefully with what we've gone through tonight, we've gone through some really quite bold flavours and then kind of died off to the sort of softer side of things. Um, and what hopefully this, this you know, kind of shows, shows everyone is that, yes, the gin is really popular in the UK. Um, and we make some absolutely fantastic gins in the UK, but there are also some incredible gins worldwide as well that are using botanicals from their area. I mean, in Nikka, there's something like Let's have a little look. There is one, two, three, four, five. There's at least five or six botanicals from Japan gone into it. Citadel, obviously, they're using juniper that's grown right, you know, right on their doorstep. Hopefully, they look to use more botanicals from. Uh, their area, the Kanema gins using botanicals from South America that you would never even think to put into gin. Um, and yeah, and Death Duels using things, you know, just three botanicals uh, which are grown on, grown in Wisconsin, or uh, at least the juniper is grown in Wisconsin. And, you know, so it, it gives you an idea of some of the interesting stuff that's going on around the world um, and some of the interesting bits. Um, from other different distilleries around the world. So yeah, so I hope everybody's enjoyed it. We've come to the end now, unfortunately. Um, if you do have any questions, please do let me know. Um, I did a full write-up of our last gin tasting, which covered all the history and the stats of gin. Um, that's up on the blog. Um, as I say, it's quite lengthy. It was very lengthy. I got my, had to get my mum to read through it to proofread it. And she was, there was something like 4,000 words or so, but I have split it so it's quite easy to navigate. So you can skip through any bits if you don't want to. Um, but yeah, if you are interested in what what the kind of uh, provenance of gin is and where it comes from, uh, how it came so popular in the UK, I'd really recommend having a little read through that. Um, if there's anything that you missed from this, I know Jeff's doing a recording of it, so we'll upload it as a YouTube video so you'll be able to go back and rewatch any bits um which would be really handy and i've just put on here as well these are like resources i've used um and really useful resources as well things like um fever tree on their website they have an interactive map which shows you where they get their different uh, botanicals that they use from so you can kind of like hover over or click on them and it will tell you that the quinine's from the Dem democratic republic of congo then they get um I think it's like vanilla from Madagascar and ginger from, I think it was India, things like that. So you can click on it and see sort of where where these botanicals all come from. Um, so yeah, some really interesting bits from there. But yeah, so yeah, we've come to the end of the tasting. So I want to thank you very much everybody for joining in. Um, I hope everybody has enjoyed. If there are any questions, please do let me know. If there's anything that you uh, want me to go over, anything, I can always answer that. You know, and yeah, what, what was your favourite gin? What did you enjoy the most? What were you thinking? I'm not too keen on that at all. Um, and yeah, but just let us know. We, we always love, love, some, uh, love some feedback. Our plan for sort of tastings in the future is that we'll be doing um, sort of spirits one uh, each month and hopefully a wine one each month as well. Jeff and I were discussing it earlier today. <laughs> um, and we... Yeah, we, we're looking, the next one we're going to do a rum tasting because at the end of next month we have um, the 50th anniversary of Black Tot uh, rum that we stock. So we're going to do a tasting around that. And I know that rum has become incredibly popular. I think Michelle uh, mentioned earlier that you're a rum drinker. So if, you know, if you're into rum, I would definitely say that. Um, that's it. That's good. Citadel and Kanema Best. Now, in, interestingly... Thank you, Kirsty, for that. Interestingly, that they're quite, um, quite complex, complex gins from that. But yeah, there's some some really nice gins we've done. Um, yeah, so a rum tasting we're going to do next, and we're hoping to do a wine tasting as well. We struggled a little bit with wine because part of the problem is uh, with the gin, with gins and spirits. Um, as you as you guys will see, in that we we can decant them into little bottles. That's fine. Um, I think I decanted them all on Sunday, then they, they go out, that's fine. And they're still fine for you to drink on Thursday evening. With wine, we're a little bit kind of more restricted. If we open the wine, we don't want it to, to go off at all. So we're looking at ways we can do that. Um, 
it might be that we can decant some stuff, but it will just have to go out on the day of the tasting, for example, um, because we don't want it to go off. We don't want it to oxidize or anything like that. So yeah, there's, there's, there's the scope there. There's a possibility of a uh, virtual bread cheese wine as well. I need to, need to speak to um, the other guys that are involved in that in Waterbrook Deli and Seven Hills. But yeah, so keep, keep your eyes peeled for things. Um, as I say, I'll be putting the link on for um, for the blog. It will be in the description of the video. So if there's anything that you're interested in, there's some, there's some interesting bits on there as well. Um, and we're, we're trying to do trying to do uh, bits of articles every couple of weeks, some lengthy ones, some, you know, just quick little snippets and things of, of stuff. Um, so, yeah. But, you know, I'm really glad you guys have enjoyed it. There's a couple, it's quite a mixed bag of favourites tonight. I know the last gin tasting, there was a couple that were like clear favourites, but we've got a few that are kind of different flavor, uh, different favourites, which is interesting. Um, so things like the Canary Mirror and the Citadel. Citadel seems to be coming up a few times, but, you know, Matt Mirror and Death's Door as well. And the Nick Coffee Gin. So it seems it's a bit of a mixed bag. I think it kind of depends on um, on your kind of palate and how you enjoy your gin. Um, you know, we've, we've covered a lot of bases with this tonight. We've covered ones that are gin that tastes very much like a gin. Uh, fruity sort of styles of gin. Quite complex uh, floral, spicy styles. Things that are really unusual. Uh, things that are a little bit sweeter. So we've covered a lot of bases tonight. But yeah. So yeah, I'm really glad uh, you guys have enjoyed it. Um, if there's any questions as well, please do give us a drop, drop us an email, give us a message and we'll, we'll sort them out for you. So yeah, lovely. Thank you very much, guys. Hope you have a good evening. Have a lovely weekend. Fingers crossed the weather uh, perks up a little bit and it doesn't rain all weekend. But yeah, thanks guys. Nice to see you all. Bye-bye.